generations and think they had it so good. Do you long for a time before the endless WhatsApp groups on your phone? Ping, 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 ping. A time when the average house price was less than 10 times the average salary. Would you go back to an age where the cinema was real people acting instead of green screen and CGI? If you could, would you go back to the days when the churches were full and Sundays were sacred? For me, I would like to go back to 1992. Between 1992 and 2000, sitting down on a Saturday night to watch Gladiators. It was so good. The Gladiators. Ridiculously muscular people who were like, how on earth they do what they do, I do not know. And there was the Contenders taking on the Gladiators. And the wonderful John Anderson with his thick Scottish accent. Contenders ready! Gladiators ready! And those wonderful, wonderful quotes. Who's afraid of the big bad wolf? As the gladiator had come on. Another one bites the dust. Now it's time for the wall. And the infamous travelator. Which as a young lad, I thought that'd be great to run up, but it's going the wrong way. It was perfect Saturday night viewing for a 6 to 14 year old boy. And do you know what? The BBC clearly agreed. Because this year, it came back. It was on our screens on a Saturday night once again. A new cast of impossibly muscular gladiators. Something that was awesome from the past. They brought it back to life. How good is that? Now all they need to do for me is to bring 24 back with Kiefer Sutherland. But there we go. And do you know what, though? The Gladiators reboot, it's okay. When I first heard that iconic music, it was supposed to be Bluetooth to the system, but it's not. <laughs> Let's try that again. Anyway, when I heard that music, for the first time this year in so long, I got goosebumps and it took me back to being a child. And it reminded me of a video I used to have with three episodes on it. And I knew the outcome so well, but I used to watch it again and again and again and again. Maybe it turns out, though, that we can't ever really go back. We can only go forward. When Jesus raises from the dead, which we celebrate today, it's not a reboot like Gladiators on the BBC is a reboot. It's not a disappointing remake. It's not a cover version. It is the true God. It is Jesus Christ himself emerging from the tomb, resurrected. The stone is rolled away. The world was never the same. That empty tomb changed the course of human history. Is it true, you might ask? How do we know what is true in a time when conspiracy theories are everywhere? When people are bending the truth to make it suit them, and news outlets have to verify videos before they post them to say, actually, that is true. Think of the furore over a slightly edited photograph from the Princess of Wales. Then we have the introduction of artificial intelligence, which makes me feel like I'm starting to live in the world of Battlestar Galactica. We have things such as deep fake, where celebrities' faces and voices are transposed onto others. And there's a whole thing about what they're concerned. What if my identity is taken by this deep fake? That's in 2024. That's scary. What's it going to be like in 2034? I dread to think. In a world where things need verifying before many will believe, how do we know what is true? Yet to this day, no one that we know of has come back to life from the dead. And if they had, boy, would that get the conspiracy theorists talking. They weren't really dead. Oh, they, you know, it was just a machine. You know, the, the machine was faulty. 
We live in a world now where truth is a movable thing. And truth depends on how reputable the source is. Let's cast our minds back 2,000 years. Something happened that would change the world forever. Something happened that would cause a huge stir in the country. Something happened that no one thought possible. The tomb was empty. Jesus was no longer there. Angels appear and tell the women, Jesus has risen. Is it true? Did the resurrection happen? Or was it just a hallucination for Mary Magdalene, Simon Peter, and the other disciple? In their grief, were they just imagining things? Like we do when we're grieving someone. Sometimes you'll see the back of somebody and you'll think, oh, and then realize it's not them because they're gone. So I want to ask you the question this morning, do you believe in the resurrection? Do you believe in the resurrection? Do we believe that Jesus died for us and rose from the dead? The answer to that question, friends, is absolutely crucial because our entire faith rests on how we answer that question. If it's true, then we worship a crucified and risen Savior who's beaten death and is alive And everything he says in here, it happened. If it isn't true, those feelings of yesterday, Holy Saturday, that darkness, confusion, loneliness, and despair continue. Jesus' ministry was a good thing while it lasted, but it's now over and time for something else to come along. Do you believe in the resurrection? Scarily. I heard once in a different diocese to this, clergy at a conference were asked, how many of you believe in the resurrection? How many do you think said yes? Less than 50%. That is appalling. How anyone can wear one of these, can listen to the Lord, can stand and preach and say that the resurrection did not happen is beyond me. And then we wonder why the church is in the state it is at the moment. The first reaction to that empty tomb and that stone being rolled away appears to be disbelief. Where is he? What have you done with the body? It just adds to the confusion. Mary Magdalene, then meets Jesus, who she thinks is the gardener. And there's a change. She's gone from despair. Where have you laid him? Through to the joy and elation when he calls her name, Mary. Rabboni, she cries. Through to joy and elation because he is alive. We don't see Mary going... Prove to me you are Jesus. Can we verify it's actually you by getting a DNA test? Yes, I know that wasn't around 2,000 years ago. Can I ask someone else to come and check that I'm not hallucinating? No. She doesn't ask any of those questions. She simply says, Rabboni, when Jesus calls her by name, she knows it is her Lord and her Savior. Mary Magdalene believed. She knows it's true. She goes to the disciples with the news and tells them everything Jesus said to her. If we continued in John's gospel beyond verse 18, we then see Jesus appear into the disciples in the locked upper room in the evening. And we all know that Thomas isn't there. Is it true? Simon Peter and the other disciple have already left and gone back to their homes when Jesus appears. They've seen the empty tomb in the linen. They believed when they saw the folded grave clothes lying there and Jesus wasn't in there. Where's the body? What's happened? No one rises from the dead. We only saw Lazarus, but that was a miracle. Jesus died. Well, a few years back, Amanda and I came across a film called Risen. Now, there is a lot of poetic license in the film, I will admit, at the start. 
but it is essentially following a Roman centurion's search for Jesus' body after the resurrection. The film shows how he finds people who've seen the risen Jesus, and he follows leads whilst being pursued by others who Pilate had instructed to follow him. Spoiler alert. It ends with the centurion witnessing some of the events that we will hear about in the coming weeks. And him acknowledging that it was a strange tale, but that he feels he will never be the same again. This Easter time, friends, I wonder if we have that same feeling. It will never be the same again. From that moment when we first surrendered our lives to Jesus and we received the Holy Spirit, there is a spiritual awakening within each of us. And we know at that point that we can never be the same again. Like those on the road to Emmaus who recognize Jesus when he breaks the bread. Once we recognize who Jesus is, the crucified and risen Savior, it is impossible to go back. We can't go back to how things were before. In our lives, in our society, and in our church. The resurrection tells us that the only way to go is forwards. Through the pain of death, to that resurrection life that we are celebrating today. If you're in the tomb today, friends, know that the path for you is forwards. Know that the path for you is out of past that stone when it is rolled away for you. Because that's what Jesus has promised. That's what Jesus has already accomplished. We can't go back to our pre-death selves, our pre-grief selves. We can only go forward with what God has in store for us. The disciples understood this. They get it. They don't try to recreate Jesus' ministry from the time before he died when he reveals himself as resurrected. How could they? Their worlds have been forever changed and turned upside down. Our world has been turned upside down by the very thing that we remember today. That Jesus has destroyed death. He has beaten the grave. And there is no victory in death anymore. The enemy has been defeated. Alleluia. Jesus has crushed the viper's head, destroyed the giant of death. His resurrection was more explosive than dynamite. He proved himself harder to destroy than diamonds. The fire and fury of hell could not contain him. He came back to life with a body made of flesh, not a phantom or a figment of the imagination, but as the resurrected Jesus Christ. That is who we celebrate today. That is who is crucial to our faith. The resurrected Christ is where our faith hangs on. It's not a myth or a legend. It is human history. It is true. So what does this mean for us today? It means that the resurrection can change our entire lives. We can stop looking for a way to go back to how things were. And we can start looking for a way forward. Forget nostalgia, but remember hope. Remember the hope that is found in Jesus Christ. In many ways, the way the world is right now, the cynical postmodern suspicion that seems to be absolutely everywhere, it can be easy to get lost. We may look back fondly on what was, but we, as the disciples of Jesus Christ, our call is to move forward into the world to bring the good news to a hurting society. We, friends, are the very people that can bring the absolute truth into society. Why? Because truth is a person. Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's a definitive article, the truth. 
That's who we can bring into a hurting world. That's who people need to hear about at the moment. When all is at sea, the truth is found in Jesus Christ. Alleluia. It's interesting, isn't it? That most people who go looking to disprove that Jesus existed or perform miracles or rose from the dead actually end up discovering that he is their Lord and Savior. Lee Strobel, for example, is probably one of the most famous. It's a well-known fact now that even atheist scholars and historians say the person of Jesus Christ existed. If we're unsure of where to look, what to do, or where to go, let's look to that empty tomb because he has risen from the dead. Let's keep returning to the fact that he took on our sins on that cross, paid the ultimate price for us, but by raising to new life has destroyed death. I was chatting with someone on WhatsApp yesterday, and we were saying that there is a reluctance of people to come to church. There is a reluctance to even come and look at the fantastic window that's been displayed this year. Why? Because I think they may be frightened of what might happen. Perhaps then, if they're frightened, it's our job to walk alongside them, to encourage them, to say it's not frightening at all, but it is a matter of life and death. Where we are now as a church is that we are fighting for biblical truths in a nation that doesn't want to know Christianity anymore. We are fighting a society that wants to bring the church down We are fighting for the name of Jesus to continue to be lifted high. It might look bleak as a church, but history shows us when the church faces threats from society, revival comes. History shows us that when the church looks down and out, revival comes. History shows us that the church cannot be defeated. Where is the church growing the most? It's in places where it's persecuted. Because Jesus cannot be contained by society. He cannot be contained by man-made rules. Because he is our Lord and Savior that has defeated even death. There's an interesting article going around at the moment talking about revival in Britain at this very time. Because there is a spiritual awakening that people want to know about Jesus. They want to hear who he is. That falls on me and you to share with the world who Jesus is. It's for us to say, well, let me talk to you about him. Who do you think he is? Is he the son of God? Yes, he is. Are we too afraid to do that there? Are we like those disciples that are locked in that upper room, afraid of the authorities, afraid of what may happen? Locked in a room, or dare I say, locked in a church. It's comfortable in here. It's an hour and a half on a Sunday morning. That's great. Or are we going to be like those disciples that we read about in Acts and onwards and go and make disciples to all ends of the earth? Acts 1.8. Are we going to go out and proclaim the good news that Jesus Christ is risen? Is it true? Well, if it's not, Pentecost can't happen. The Holy Spirit can't be poured out on all believers. If it's not true, we wouldn't see signs and wonders in the here and the now. If it's not true, we're all just wasting our time this morning. If it's not true, we've no hope for the future. If it's not true, then I gave up a career in law to do something that's probably harder than being a lawyer, as a pastor, as a vicar. If it's not true, then what happens when we die? Well, that's it. We, friends, know that the resurrection is true. We know that the gospel reading we heard this morning is the truth. We know that Mary Magdalene and the disciples saw Jesus and shared the news so that we too can know him in 2024. We know that when Jesus rose from the dead, it wasn't a reboot. It wasn't a second chance to continue the work he began. It was resurrection power that brings a whole new meaning to the world that changes the course of human history. It is earth-shattering. 
It's not just a case of, oh, lovely, it's Easter Day today. We are celebrating an earth-shattering event that has never happened before and that will never happen again. In the same way, because I know we will all rise in glory. So the question, once again this morning, do you believe in the resurrection? God has brought us here today for such a time as this. If you know in your bones that there is more to life than this material world, that we are more than just a random collection of atoms spiraling through time and space, if your heart tells you that your life has purpose, that you were made for beauty, hope, and love, if you know that we cannot go back to what was before, then let's celebrate the truth. That is Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. The resurrection brings earth-shattering consequences. The resurrection brings life, hope, a future worth living for. It brings us into communion with God our Father. It allows us to sing our praises to the one who is worthy. Easter is a day of celebration. It's a day of hope, a day of victory, and a day of resurrection. So let's pray in that resurrection power now. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you rose from the dead. We thank you that you are the absolute truth in a society where truth seems to be a movable feast. We thank you that even if we feel we are in the tomb, that after three days you broke free and rose to life once again. And we know that that resurrection power lives in each of us. Jesus, we worship you. We adore you as our risen Savior and Lord. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray. Come and have your way in us. Amen.